Hello and welcome to the 15 Minute Book Club, presented by me, myself, David West, produced by Assistant Under Librarian Wilson. Good evening. And delivered to you by Grandmaster of the Pigeon Cree, El Gavster. We are located in the dusty loft space of the Great Winter Library, far in the northern wastes, from where we spend our days repairing old books, filing out of date library cards, and speaking in hushed tones. And it's here that we take an occasional 15 minute break to create a podcast using an old Grundig reel to reel tape recorder and sending the finished uh, recording by Carrier Pigeon many miles south, where, via the miracle of Valve technology and a bloke in a garage wearing a brown coat, who just happens to keep a supercomputer next to his fridge freezer, it's transformed into something that we call a podcast. And this podcast, as we call it, is all about the book. And as an aside, if you like what we what you hear, like if you like what we do over the next quarter hour, please consider subscribing, liking, or maybe just buying us some chocolate cake. It's all good. Anyway, moving on. We like to look at all things book related. This can be a review, an interview, an overview, a classic, a bestseller, a random book that no one's ever heard of, a particular writer, genre, or theme, a question of some sort, whatever. We're all about the written word. And this week, I'm going to pretend I'm intellectual by kicking off the podcast randomly with a quote from everyone's favourite stoic, deep thinker and lifelong despot, Marcus Aurelius. He says this, If you are distressed by anything external, the pain is not due to the thing itself, but to your estimate of it. And this you have the power to revoke at any moment. And you know, I'm no expert in the practice of stoicism or despotism, but I think what old Marcus meant was that it's often we, not others, that inflict misery on ourselves because it's our calibration of pain or distress that makes us unhappy. Our reaction to events dictates our perception of good or bad. Which is easy to say in the abstract, but if you're struggling with emotional distress or grief, it's not always easy to achieve a state of benign balance. But I think he's correct certainly in day-to-day life, whether we get caught up in traffic, as I did this afternoon, called out on Facebook, or we get angry at newspaper articles, often do. Do you get angry at newspaper articles, Producer Wilson? Never. I don't read the papers. <laughs> well, I, I try not to. It's very un, it's very unhelpful to my, my emotional well-being. Or if you have a row with your significant other. At some point, we probably all had the chance to ignore it. We probably had the opportunity to walk away, the chance indeed to step away from that river of shite. But instead, we dove right in. So maybe in future, think twice before diving into those deep, dank waters. Because swimming in shit won't make your life smell of roses, and you may drown. So choose to step away from anger and pain. And anyway, moving away from the Emperor's wise words and my psycho babble, let's get on to this week's book focus. I want to start this talk by briefly mentioning narrative structure. There are a number of models for the narrative progress of a novel, a number of archetypal structures. They're taught in writing classes, in literature classes, they're described in books on how to write. They're clear and simple signposts on how to structure a book, a story or a novel. I won't list all the various permutations. It's a topic we can delve into or might well delve into in a future podcast. But the simplest, most essential structure I've ever come across to describe the fundamental plot structure of a novel is a three-part structure that goes like this. One, equilibrium. Two, disequilibrium. Three, new equilibrium. And to explain that, I'll give an example from a book we looked at a few episodes ago. The Hobbit, and that's a classic of this structure. The equilibrium at the beginning of the novel is this. Bilbo Baggins is a quiet, unadventurous and respectable hobbit from the Shire who lives a placid and uneventful life. The disequilibrium begins when he is visited by a wizard and 13 dwarfs who take him on an adventure. The new equilibrium occurs when he returns home after this adventure braver, wiser and wealthier but no longer a respectable member of the hobbit community. Oh yeah, another example would be Harry Potter, where each individual novel follows this example, the same structure, and the series as a whole also follows the same structure too. So, the thing is, today's novel, the one we're going to look at now, shirks that model. The entire story details the efforts of a 17-year-old girl to maintain the equilibrium of her life as it exists from the beginning of the book. She's tempted by the disequilibrium, but ultimately she recalls from it. And the end of the book is the girl, her father, and their lifestyles unchanged. There is no, there is no new equilibrium. 
at least on the surface. And the book we're talking about is Bonjour Tristesse by Francois Sergon. It was written by Sergon when she was 18 years old and she says she wrote it because she failed her baccalaureate exams and needed to do something instead of going to college, which is nice. <laughs> it was first published in 1954 to mixed reviews. For example, the Spectator, the Spectator in their wisdom, labelled it a sad, vulgar little book, but it's not. Uh, rather, it's a powerful account of the damage people can do to others in pursuit of their own happiness, or rather, in defence of their own happiness. The plot revolves around 17-year-old Cecile and her father Raymond, a wealthy, amoral playboy who flits from lover to lover, party to party, never settling down. This allows Cecile, too, to live in idle luxury, to live in a, ceaseless, a world of ceaseless parties and flirtations with nothing ever taken seriously, and in which Cecile is always the most important person in her father's life. This is the world Cecile loves, and the world she fights face to defend, when the threat of disequilibrium in the shape of her father's friend Anne, a cultured, intelligent and driven woman who her father decides he wants to marry. The novel describes Cecile's reaction to this threat to her life of idle luxury, her relationship with Anne, with her father, with his former love Elsa, and the young man who is in love with her, called Cyril, and how the various characters are manipulated to help thwart the romance between Anne and her father. One thing the spectator got right was that the novel is short at around 95 pages and 18 chapters. But the vulgar part, well, I guess that describing a life, a life of idle luxury with a womanising father and an honest to the point of immorality daughter might have been vulgar in post-war France. The author Francois Sagon and the protagonist and narrator Cecile, with her extremely relaxed attitude towards promiscuity, was at least 10 years ahead of the counterculture, the curve that arrived in the mid-1960s. And currently, Bonjour Tristesse stands at 41 in Le Mans' list of top 100 novels of the 20th century, which isn't bad for a short, vulgar novel written by a teenager. So the first thing I want to discuss briefly is time, how it affects this novel, or time or its absence, how it's important, because the events take place just a few years after the, event, after the end of World War II, but there is zero mention of the war, or the five years of Nazi occupation, which Cecile and her father would have experienced, and there is no mention at all of her mother, whose death has allowed their relationship, her relationship with her father to become so exclusive. Time for Cecile barely exists. Her entire life is ephemeral. Parties, social gatherings, holidays, afternoons lying on the beach. The passage of time is only dimly registered. She has no responsibilities and her life requires nothing from her, not even a clock or a calendar. When Cecile responds to Anne's comment on her apparent worldliness, saying that after 10 years of convent school she finds the immorality of others fascinating, Anne replies tartly that it's two years since she left school. Two years in which she has done precisely nothing except be indulged by her wealthy father. Time does not exist. Cecile's entire life is a round of parties and transitory friendships funded by her indulgent father Raymond. There is no future, no past, only a shallow, decadent now. And talking of a father, Raymond. Raymond is wealthy, though we never discuss what it is he does. He's a widower, 40 years old, handsome, but we never find out anything about his deceased wife, Cecile's mother, or how her death affected him. He's only seen as Cecile's enabler, her protector, and the object of her affection, the only person she really cares for. She sees their relationship as that of, a, of platonic travellers, moving from feast to feast, never stopping, never considering, always moving on. And Cecile indulges his various lovers because ultimately they do not threaten her relationship with Raymond. As she says when they're planning to move to the Riviera for the summer, her father needed women around him and I knew that Elsa would not get in our way. In any case, father and I were so delighted at the prospect of going away together that we were in no mood to cavil. And her father describes her later in the novel thus, My little accomplice, what would I do without you? Cecile is aware of the pointlessness of their life together, even as she acknowledges Anne's effect on their life, as she says, My life and my father's upheld the theory one can be just as attached 
to futilities as anything else. So when he, when, when Raymond decides to marry Anne, Cecile feels that Raymond, her father, has abandoned her. She swats aside any psychological depth of this response, however, stating, one might endow me with a spectacular complexes such as incestuous love for my father or a morbid passion for Anne. But it's neither. It's simply that in her father she has an escape from reality, a haven from maturity, a shelter against the future. While she is with her father, she doesn't need to become anything. As I noted earlier, time does not really exist. If there's a future, perhaps 20 years from now, all, all that will be changed, Cecile believes, is that perhaps the roles will be reversed. She will be the one with a string of lovers, and her father will be her accomplice. Her father is affectionate. He, he is her confidant. He never judges, never skimps on money. In fact, I don't, think, I don't think Cecile mentions money in the entire novel. Her father simply pays for everything. And I've got to ask, has there ever been such a dad? Really? I don't think so. Producer Wilson, what do you think? Certainly not me, Dave. <laughs> Certainly not me either. Anyway, Raymond is present all the way through the story. And yet, apart from the closeness of Cecile and his appetite for the love of women, an appetite he apparently expends almost no effort on satiating, he is a distant character. He exists in the present but not in the past or the future. He is the handsome, ephemeral object of everyone's aff affection. He exists simply as the repository of the female gaze of Cecile and Elsa and Anne. As Cecile says, of course it was possible for Anne to love him, for anyone to love him. And Anne, her father's future wife, what is it that so infuriates Cecile? What is it she does? What does she represent that, that threatens Cecile's existence? Because as, Anne, as Cecile admits, Anne is a positive influence. She's self-assured, she's elegant, intelligent, capable, and she only wants the best for Cecile. She even endures pain silently as when she first arrives and Raymond is still emotionally attached to Elsa, she says nothing and behaves with impeccable manners. But as polished and as glamorous as she is, she's no saint. She repeatedly describes herself as tired, an appeal for sympathy that she employs skillfully to get her own way. And she steals Raymond from Elsa with a swift, steely effectiveness of a stiletto blade, and then arranges for Cecile to deal with the fallout. And later she dismisses, dismisses Cecile's love interest, Cyril, forever with a simple phrase, I don't, want to, I don't wish to see you again. Cultured and capable, sometimes selfish and vulnerable, Anne represents the future. She represents sobriety. She represents a life which will suddenly be given equilibrium by Anne's intelligence and refinement. The life I had envied her, as Cecile says. Because a large part of what Cecile wants is what Anne has. She is attracted to a life with her as a stepmother. She says of that future, I will be influenced, reoriented, remodelled by Anne. I would not even mind it. Six months... I should no longer even wish to resist, because Anne represents a maturity that 17-year-old Cecile believes she can avoid, and so she hatches a plan, she engages others, and she employs them in a callous manner to sabotage the relationship between Raymond and Anne. The end of the novel I won't give away, it's quite shocking, but the events that occur and Cecile's reaction to it after the fact are equally shocking. I'll say no more than that though, um, but the end result is the equilibrium of her previous life is maintained. And the new equilibrium that Anne will bring is avoided. There is no hero's journey in this novel. There is no new equilibrium. There is no growth or development beyond a feeling of tristesse, a melancholy sadness that Cecile welcomes in bed early on a morning in Paris with the noise of passing cars and the streets below. Because Bonjour Tristesse translates as Hello Sadness. It's an excellent novel and it's extraordinary that it was written by Francois, Francois Sagan when she was 17. And I'm still not sure how I feel about it, about Cecile and Raymond and especially Anne. The novel leaves an aftertaste and I struggle with my feelings towards the characters and towards the events recounted. And on that bombshell, this is David Wares and the 15 Minute Book Club and we'll see you next week for something completely different.